Now we don't have to average these windows. What we can do is that we can get this uh, time frequency decomposition for all these time frequency points. And we can do that for each single trial. So this was one trial. So at zero millisecond is the stimulus presentation, 10 millisecond after stimulus, 20 millisecond after the stimulus. And we have that, like here I have three trials. And now I'm going to do the averaging across the trials. So I'm going to have uh, uh, what, I, what we call the ERS, the event related spectrum. So the event here, for instance, let's say the event is at 20 millisecond. This is going to, uh, this is uh, going to be how it's going to look like. This is going to be the power here, 60 millisecond after uh, the stimulus at 5 hertz. And here you can see that it's hard to see what's going on. Why? Because the low frequency here have much higher power than the high frequency. So what we usually do to counter that is that we're going to remove the baseline value right here. So by the way, this is, this is the formula for completing the event-related spectrum. This is my complex number here, my, my vector at frequency f and time t. And uh, this is trial number k. And I take the, uh, this, is, this takes the length of the vector, and this is the square, and I just do the average. So this is the actual formula that's implemented. It's super simple. The other thing you can do for visualization is that we usually sc scale to dB. So we take the log uh, when we scale, because it's easier to see uh, frequencies that with very different amplitudes. So now I'm going to uh, remove the baseline. So what I do is that I compute the average in uh, here at 5 hertz before the stimulus occurs. And then I'm going to subtract it from all, uh, all the, uh, the time windows right here. And I'm going to obtain this, uh, this kind of plot. And you can see now that it's much easier to see what's going on. Now is the stimulus right here, obviously before 0, uh, it's about zero because we've subtracted the average at each single frequency. And after zero, we can see changes in power. So for instance, here we have decrease in power at about 30 hertz. We have increase in power at very low frequency here, about 10 hertz. So this is, this is the same thing. And we could see here a little bit, you know, there was a little bit of blue right here, but it was masked because of the color scale. And now we can see much better this decrease of frequency uh, right here. Now, for subtracting the baseline, there is, it's, there is some caveat because you can either uh, subtract the baseline or div divide by the baseline. And different offers use different methods. The good thing in EGLAB, you can do uh, the one you want. So you can either use divisive baseline or you can use a subtractive baseline. And the divisive baseline depends on the gain model. Like the stimulus is going to increase the gain. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to... Uh, increase the, uh, so if there was some underlying oscillation, it's going to uh, put a gain on this oscillation. And the additive model is just going to add a fixed amount of uh, oscillation, if you see uh, what I mean. This is, this is kind of technical, but it's good to know that there is different types of baseline applied by different people, so you need to know uh, what you're doing. And we believe in the gain model, and, and, uh, and we can explain you why in detail. But um, this, is, this is getting too detailed. Now, what's the difference between the frequency, uh, the uh, FFT, and the wavelet? Well, the main difference is that the number of cycles for wavelets as I increase frequencies decreases. So, so you now the number of cycles stays constant. So here I have wavelets, and I had three cycles at the lowest frequency. And uh, at the highest frequency, I still have three cycles. I have three peaks right there. For FFT, the size of the window remains the same. So it means I try to fit as many cycles as I can in, in the window. This is the only difference between uh, wavelet and, and FFT. So as you can see, the wavelet, the advantage of the wavelet is going to be much more specific in time. When you have this big window and you slide it, obviously, your resolution for time at high frequency is going to be relatively poor. When you have this small here, this small wavelet, and you slide it in time, you're going to have relatively high uh, time resolution. 
but it comes at a cost. The cost is that the, uh, the time resolution is higher for wavelets, but it's the frequency resolution is lower for wavelets. Why is uh, that so? So here is our FFT and here is uh, our wavelet. This is a signal, this is the idealized EEG signal with the exact same carrying frequency as the FFT and the wavelet. So they are perfectly aligned, so I'm going to convolve this signal by this signal, so multiply every, every point here at the same latency and then sum over all the points and here everything is positive. So I'm going to get a positive number right here. For wavelets, I'm going to do the same thing. Again, we, I have the same carrier frequency, so it's the same thing, so I have a positive number. Now let's say I change the frequency of, uh, of my signal a little bit. So it's a little bit lower, so the center is still aligned, but now when I look uh, off here at the trails, they're not aligned anymore. So I'm going to have, I'm, here I'm, com I'm going to multiply these two numbers, I'm going to get a positive number, but here they're opposite phase, so I'm going to get negative numbers. So this is going to be a positive number and this is going to be uh, uh, close to zero because I have positive and negative numbers. For the wavelet, however, you can see that because the peaks are so close to each other, I'm still going to get positive numbers for all, uh, uh, all three peaks right here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to, so here I'm less specific in terms of frequency. They both respond to the signal that has the perfect uh, uh, that's, that's the uh, same carrying frequency as the wavelet or the FFT. But when we change the frequency, we make it lower, the FFT is going to be more selective uh, uh, than the wavelet here. And same if you're too high frequency. Here we have, I have misalignment on the trail and here I don't have, uh, uh, I have misalignment but it's not that big. So this is going to give me the wavelet here at high frequency is going to give me a broad, a broad peak. In, in the frequency domain. The FFT is going to give me a more sharper, sharper image. So which one to use? Is it better to use the wavelet and have high, frequency, high time resolution, low frequency resolution? Or is it better to use the FFT and have low, low time resolution, high frequency resolution? And uh, best is to use in between the two. So this is what, uh, so this is just an image. So this is pure FFT and this is pure wavelet. And here you can see that the wavelet here loses in frequency. So we had this, this decrease right here. And here it's not visible uh, anymore. So, uh, so we, use, we use in between the two. And so we have this, uh, what we call this wavelet factor. And uh, when it's zero, it's the same as FFT. And when it's one, it's the same as wavelets. And when you put it in the middle, it's going to modulate uh, the size of, uh, of the window right there. And so you can do in between wavelets and FFT. And, uh, and we don't really, so you can't really call that wavelets because wavelets are supposed to be always the same, uh, the same number of cycle at all the frequencies. And even wavelets, they're supposed to be, uh, um, uh, there's supposed to be uh, uh, frequencies that increase uh, like 2, 4 hertz, 8 hertz, 16 hertz, and uh, 32 hertz, etc. So these are true wavelets. True wavelets, we always have the same number of cycles, and uh, we always uh, uh, increase uh, by a power of 2. Why? Because this is optimal for compression of signal. So if you want to compress your signal, if you want to do JPEG compression, you're going to do bidimensional wavelets. But for visualization, we, we don't really care if it's, uh, so we don't really care if we have like two, four hertz, eight hertz. On the contrary, we want to see, we want to see as much detail as we want. So we're going to increase here the frequency uh, with every single hertz, for instance. And so this can't be really called wavelets. It's just modified wavelets. And also we're going to make the Highest, higher frequency, we're going to, here we're going to have, there was only three cycle, we're going to make it eight cycle. So we have a good trade-off between time and frequency resolution. So these are not real wavelets, these are just optimal time frequency decomposition for uh, visualization. And once more, it's because we're not interested in compressing the signal, we're just interested in looking at what's uh, in the signal.
this is so this is uh, 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 the reason why you can have perfect time and frequency resolution. This is because of the lower bound to the Heisenberg products. So this is uh, some theorem in physics. But there is a lower bound to the uh, time and frequency resolution you can have. So you, you can have both at the same time. And this was the wavelet factor. So here is 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. And in EG lab, actually, uh, and I'm going to show that in one of the next slides. You can you can set your exact number of cycle at all the frequency. You can tell EG Lab, I want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hertz, and I want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cycles if you want to. So you can specify the exact number of cycle at each frequency you're using, or you can use this this shortcut, which is the wavelet factor. And in a few slides, I'm going to show you the my my personal preferred method. 